Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to our panel discussion tonight titled Diversity in the Interior Design Industry Then and Now. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Terry Fiore and I'm the New Jersey ASID chapter president. I'd also like to introduce to our, um, everyone to our president-elect, Virginia Liberato, who's with us tonight. And the panelists will be, um, they will be introduced later. Our programs and student affairs committees have worked tirelessly to bring you this important topic tonight. I'd like to thank our program committee chair, Elena Spina. Can we wave, Elena? <laughs> MJ Drago and Judy Crook as well as, as the Student Affairs Committee comprised of our chair, Jeffrey McCullough, MJ Devino, um, Nadine El Takawi, who is in the audience tonight, and Miriam Abdel Hamid, who's also in the audience. Virginia? Oh, I also wait before we, um, before we move on, I'd like to thank our amazing sponsors, uh, Sherwin Williams. Design NJ Magazine and Benjamin Moore for your support this entire year. Virginia. Awesome, thank you. Just a little housekeeping for tonight. This presentation is being recorded and will live on our website and YouTube channel. Everyone except for the panelists will be muted during the presentation. Please enter your questions in the Q&A and we'll address them in the last 30 minutes during our Q&A period. And now without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Jeffrey McCullough. Good evening, everybody. I'm Judy Crook, I'm ASID member and business owner. I'd like to introduce to you this evening, uh, Mr. Jeffrey McCullough, allied ASID, uh, head of the Student Affairs Committee for the New Jersey ASID 2021 and my <laughs> Notes are gone. There they are. I apologize. Designer, historian, and educator is a native of Claxton, Georgia. Jeffrey worked in New York City for Henson and Company, Edward Jackson and Associates, and Eric Kohler Design before establishing Jeffrey McCullough Design Consulting in 2003. Each firm style has informed his various projects in New York, Chicago, Connecticut. Vermont, New Jersey, Michigan, Georgia, and Louisiana, with a major in interior design from the Fighter Accredited Interior Design School of Georgia Southern University. McCullough lived in New York full-time for nine years and has lived in New York and Lafayette, Louisiana since 2008. McCullough was named of the top 10 under 40 designers by New York Spaces Magazine in 2007 and has had projects published in House and Garden, Traditional Home, Hamptons, Cottages and Gardens, and House and Home magazines. An adjunct professor at Berkeley College in New Jersey and Parsons, the New School in New York, McCullough teaches history of architecture and interiors, objects as history, career management, and professional practice courses. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Let's first start by recognizing that it's Hispanic Heritage Month. So our timing for this program couldn't be better. In the words of Randy Pfizer, CEO of ASID National until 2020, history is an extraordinary thing. There's the history that's beautiful that we never want to forget. And then there's the history that's tragic that we wish we never had to experience or even know but that cannot for the sake of the future be forgotten. All of that history, the good and the bad is reflected in the design of its own time and the design of a future. In other words, to understand today, we must know yesterday. It's important that you understand the parameters of the research that I'm presenting tonight. First of all, this is a brief history. It is in no way complete. That would take hours and hours. It is focused on interior design, not architecture or other professional avenues in the design world, strictly interior design. It is about the United States, not international. The special focus is on New York and New Jersey area, since this is where we live and these states are two of the most diverse in the country in terms of population. But please note that diverse in population does not automatically or necessarily equate to integrated. 
And there's a hyper focus on the American Society of Interior Designers, New Jersey chapter, because that's who we are. Interestingly, interior design as a career path began with diversity. At a time when women were not encouraged to seek professional success, Candace Wheeler and Elsie DeWolf, the true pioneers of interior design in America, bucked the system and became great successes. Candace Wheeler, in turn, created many jobs for women who worked with her on textile and wallpaper design, which became her primary focus after just a few years as a practicing interior designer. Therefore, she's sometimes referred to as the mother of interior design for the work that she did for others in creating jobs. Elsie DeWolf, the one that we credit as inventing our profession in America, was a lesbian who lived openly with her longtime partner. It was through entertaining in their house that her career began when she was hired to design the Colony Club, the private club that many of her friends were members of. It's with this project that began in 1905 that the concept of independent interior designer became a profession. And for those who know, yes, Elsie DeWolf did later become Lady Mendel when she married a man, but that was only after the death of her female companion. The marriage was one of society and monetary upward movement. I just wanna show an example of Candace Wheeler's interior design work, uh, the veterans room at Park Avenue Armory, which she did with Louis Comfort Tiffany in the late 1880s, and Elsie DeWolf, DeWolf's work at the Colony Club from 1905 to 1907, just noting that both of these women did not start with residential interior design, but with hospitality or commercial design. It's important to know that our profession was strictly marketed to women for many years. What you see on the screen here is um, the title of a 1907 article called A Woman's Profession from House and Garden Magazine, all about how perfect the profession of interior design was for women. Uh, there's both negative and positive language in that article. If you'd ever like to see it, you can contact me for it. And on the right, you see a 1969 ad from the LaSalle Extension University, a correspondence style education for women. This was in House Beautiful Magazine. And you can think that the equivalent of what an online certificate in interior design is today, but before there was online, it would be correspondence courses. Note what it says. It's a high income field where a woman is in her glory. The demand for decorating services is at a peak and opportunities are unlimited. Even if you use only part of your time, you can train at home without interrupting your regular duties. They are strictly marketing to housewives and mothers in this. And I don't want you to get hung up on the language of decorator versus designer. The, the language designer has not fully come in to play at the point that the, both of these articles were done. It is, of course, important to recognize that these women were the ones who, that these women started what would become an, a female dominated profession in, of American design in the early 20th century. In addition to DeWolf and Candace Wheeler, Ruby Ross Wood, Rose Cumming, Frances Elkins, Dorothy Draper, and more were the stars of their day. <laughs> that, fem that female dominance of the interior design world shifted, however, in the 1940s when men began making their mark by getting projects published that were for America's most stylish and known families. More than just the fact that men were decorating these homes, these were gay men. Billy Haynes was the first openly gay uh, interior designer. He, he had to switch professions when he was forced to decide if he would continue being a movie star by being a closeted person or if he wanted to be his authentic self, a gay man, he had to leave the movie industry. His dear friend, Joan Crawford, you see in the image on the left, gave him his first project. He ended up designing her houses um, for years and years and years. And his last project is on the right. This is a very important house as it's the US ambassador to England's residence. He had the ambassador as a private client for their homes in California. And when, the, when uh, Annenberg became the ambassador to England, they hired Billy Haynes to do Winfield House. Billy Baldwin and Albert Hadley would come soon after and be openly gay men who were sort of ruling the interior design world in New York at the time, both trained with prominent female designers, uh, Billy Baldwin with Ruby Ross Wood and Albert Hadley first at Macmillan and then later by partnering with Sister Parrish. But in terms of color of skin, the industry was nearly all white until the 1970s. By then, real design education was available for far more people. Some of the products of that design education in terms of diverse representations of the industry include Ruben de Saavedra, a larger than life Puerto Rican. 
There were Latino designers that we could celebrate in addition to De Saavedra, but no Latina designers. The, uh, Ruben De Saavedra was a darling of the magazine editors, and that's often what it takes to get your work published. He was published quite often in the 1970s and 80s. Sadly, he would be one of a number of many men who died of the AIDS epidemic, and he passed away young in 1990. A rare Middle Eastern designer to receive loads of press and massive projects was Calaf Alaton, a dashing and sophisticated Turkish designer who lived in Los Angeles. He too was a darling of the media, especially Paige Rents from Architectural Digest who published his work very, very often. You see two examples here. In terms of black designers though, it wouldn't be until the trailblazer Cecil Hayes went to design school in the mid 1970s in Miami, Florida, and then established her own for firm, which was a store that would lead to clients because she could not get work with a design firm. It would take her 40 years and many celebrity clients later to be inducted into the AD 100, that's the architectural 100 list. Celebrity clients were crucial for African-American designers to get a project published. You see Cecil Hayes here in 2010 on the left and on the right, a 2019 project. I arrived in New York in 1999, a young gay man from rural South Georgia. I went to work in the D&D building, then the epicenter of American design. I saw many brown and black people in the building every day, but most were not designers shopping for clients in the showrooms. They were the sample desk clerks salespeople in the showrooms, the doormen, the porters. Only a few black designers were present. Sheila Bridges was the most visible and well-known. You see here, Sheila Bridges became so well-known because uh, primarily after former president Bill Clinton tapped her to design his Harlem office after he was president, that she even became a coffee ad. I mean, that is something. It was a coffee ad specifically for Architectural Digest magazine, but nonetheless, that's how present and prominent she was. Um, I, I want you to read this quote from Time Magazine because it is both praising of Sheila Bridges and cutting in terms of her clientele. So deep is the talent of Sheila Bridges, she can refine the lives of hip hop entrepreneurs and former presidents. You think about that for a little bit, what that means. This is from Time Magazine, not a design magazine in 2001. Sheila Bridges is still a star today. You see Sheila, these are both from 2020 on the left in El Decor last year and another roundup of her favorite things. And on the right last year when her own house in the Hudson Valley was the featured cover story. Roderick Shade, this, sorry, Sheila Bridges in 2014 got this project published. It's a Harlem townhouse that she did for clients. And in 2020, interestingly enough, El Decor declared as part of the reckoning that they were going to be sharing other voices in other rooms. But I find it um, sort of odd that they didn't actually expand by including another designer's work in this editor's letter, but one that they had featured many, many, many times. Just sort of something to point out. Roderick Shade was the only black man I ever saw shopping at the D&D building in 1999 and 2000. Roderick lived in Harlem and he published a, building, a book in 2002 called Harlem Style. He was included on the AD 100 list in 2005, and that was after in 2004, he had, been, he had done the master bedroom dressing area that you see on the right, which was part of AD's design exhibit at the very new and very exciting, everyone wanted to be there, Time Warner Center, for those of you who remember when that building opened, I was there for that design exhibit. By 2001, Elaine Griffin came on the scene and she, got to get, she began getting lots of publicity. Elaine had gone to work in the mid nineties for Peter Marino, a very prominent, very prominent architect. And uh, then she went out on, the, uh, on her own in the late 1990s. She was a fellow Georgian like me. And so we had that bond and we got to be quite close. Elaine wrote a book in 2009 and she also became a TV star and she still makes TV appearances today. You can see a project of hers that's been published in El Decor on the right. And then there was Daryl Carter, who was actually from Washington, D.C., but came to New York quite a lot for design work that he was doing. Um, he, too, came on the scene at about that time, 2000, 2001, but more in the 2001 area, where you can see on the image on the left, he's showing off his new furniture collection. On the right is a 2012 client project. And he really 
really um, is still one of the media darlings today. I think it's interesting that I want what I want to point out to you is that, sh that Sheila Bridges, Daryl Carter, and Elaine Griffin all had previous careers that made them financially secure. And they actually used their design work in their own houses as their calling card to get clients. It was getting their own work of, in their own houses seen first that got them their projects. And it's important to recognize that this was not their first calling, but they had the money to go to Parsons and go to New York School of Interior Design and get another degree after they had completed their first. In terms of Latino designers, the most prominent one in, during this time of the early 2000s was Vincent Wolf. His real name is Vicente Wolf. He's Cuban, but he goes by Vincent Wolf, and he is still quite a popular designer today. Recognition and by magazines and organizations is very important to the success of designers. And it's important that we note that from 1998 to 2018, the only designers of color that appeared on the best in US list by magazines were the Latino designers that I mentioned before, Vincent Wolf, in addition to Juan Montoya and Benjamin Noriega Ortiz, the only Asian designer, George Yabu of Yabu Pushelberg, and the only black designers on these lists, Sheila Bridges and Daryl Carter. That's only, that's a very, very small number. What I'll call the reckoning came in 2019 and 2020. The Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality against minorities opened discussions in all industries, including ours. The fact that the Black Interior Designers Network had been formed a few years prior and that there was a newly organized Black Artists and Designers Guild garnered attention throughout the industry and conversations about this had to happen. This led to editors of prominent magazines recognizing the decades long omission of talented designers. And in 2019, 2020, all of the leading magazines greatly expanded their inclusion of designers of color. You'll just see the cover page of El Decor in 2019 with their new alias. They say design's future is female. It had already been primarily white female, but now we were adding women of color. And on the right, you see the, the dream that what our industry will look like is the image that you see, a rainbow colored humanity. And this is an important article that came out. 25 black interior designers speak frankly about their careers, successes and challenges in Architectural Digest in 2019. When, when the Black Interior Designers Guild was formed and started having an annual conference, it got press. And in 2019, it really got press. Magazines covered the conference that was happening for Black interior designers. And they really covered the press and the activities when Maylene Barrett formed uh, the Black Artist and Designers Guild, both of which you see press clippings for. The, I could have done 10 slides of headlines from 2019 and 2020 addressing uh, the diversity issue in our industry, but these are just a few. I want us to look at the current student population of interior design majors in New Jersey, because I believe that's really important. We know that the student populations are diverse, but how many get careers from their degree and become part of the interior design profession? How many stay in the industry? How many join a professional organization? Those are statistics that we need to know so that we don't have to wonder why there is sometimes a gap from student member to allied member to professional member of ASID. Of the 17 Bachelor of Fine Arts degree seeking students that I'm currently teaching, 75% of them are non-white. And it was the same last year. MJ DeVino from Kane University will share insights into the demographics of Kane University in his presentation tonight. 21 names of Asian, Black, and Latinx designers were gathered from ASID New Jersey chapter leadership and past leadership. Of those 21, seven are members of ASID. Their names are listed here. And these are designers that we absolutely want to celebrate. But we also want to recognize that only 30% of those known designers in New Jersey um, are members of the chapter. 70% are not. Tammy Bolden, who you'll hear from tonight, is one of them. And it's just an example of her excellent work. Blanche Garcia recently got a project published in AD Middle East. It's a New Jersey house. Another project by Blanche Garcia won gold in ASID New Jersey's Design Excellence Awards in 2019. Hong Jen has repeatedly won Design Excellence Awards in ASID New Jersey chapter events. 
And Satomi Yoshida Katz, a principal in the firm of YS, YZDA Design Atrium in Short Hills, was part of our residential panel moderated by Tammy Bolden earlier this year. And these are examples of her work. There are so many names that you need to know, and I can't list them all, but I just want to say that these that are on the screen, Rajni Alex, Raymond Boozer, Everett Brown, Gail Davis, Corey Damon Jenkins, Mia Jung, Rodney Lawrence, Kia McSwain, Kareem Rashid, Shamir Shah, Kita Turner, Kia Weatherspoon are just some of the names that you really need to know. They are movers and shakers in our industry that are doing excellent work. We know that we have a diverse popula population of designers, uh, aspiring designers in New Jersey. We must, in order to move forward as a professional organization, look at what our chapter demographics are. We first must realize that having a diverse audience doesn't mean we have a diverse organization. Having people hear what we say and see what we do is not the same as giving minority designers a platform for their voice and their work. And ultimately that is the goal of any professional organization. In addition to the excellent work that the chapter already does, I have, I have proposed a diversity task force for the 2021-2022 fiscal year with these goals. To survey the ASID New Jersey membership to learn demographics of the chapter, discover what the hurdles in the interior design industry are for minority designers, enlighten, current and future chapter leadership about the demographics and hurdles. Through various chapter committees, provide resources to address the hurdles. And finally, promote the diversity that exists within the chapter by featuring designers in chapter programs, press, and, to, and marketing. Tonight is going to be a fantastic start to those initiatives. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Jeffrey. That was incredibly interesting. Um, next, I would like to introduce you to Nada Fazi Alzabi, Allied ASID. She is an interior designer and project manager with AK Architecture in Rochelle Park, New Jersey. She is currently professional development director for the chapter and president-elect for 2021-22. A native of Palestine, Nada has lived in Libya, Sultanate of Oman, Jordan, and Egypt, which cultivated an appreciation for diversity and an understanding of various cultures. After immigrating to the US and then marrying and raising two children, Nada decided to continue her education at Kane University's Michael Graves School of Architecture. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Interior Design in 2016. Nada's passions for human rights and justice for all, as well as education, have led her to become active in many organizations. These include the Democratic Party of Maplewood, New Jersey, where she serves as a district leader, board member at the Asawa Family Foundation that supports relief organizations fighting against hunger and domestic violence, as well as educational institutions providing educational tools and facilities, and the Al Mishkat Weekend School at the Islamic Center of Union County, for which she is the founder and principal. Believing that housing is a fundamental human right, she sees her work as a designer as a perfect tie-in with her activism. Thank you, Nada. Thank you. That was impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and since we are talking diversity, I would like to greet uh, you all with our Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, peace be upon you all. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Nada Fauzi Al Zabi. I'm honored to be part of this wonderful event tonight. And um, <laughs> I'm honored to be part of this wonderful event uh, tonight, which will definitely allow us to know more about each other and um, understand one another and be inspired by our shared stories, experience, and differences. And I would like to start my presentation with a beautiful verse from the Quran, uh, which is the Muslim holy book, uh, that have always worked for me as a guidance and inspiration. I will read it in the beginning in Arabic 
uh, the way it was revealed, uh, then read the translation for all of you in English. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqanakum min dhakarin wa unta wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum inna Allaha alimun khabir Sadaqallah O mankind, indeed we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. Surely the most noble of you is the in sight of God is the most righteous among you. And God is truly all-knowing and all-aware. This is from chapter 49, verse 13. So being guided by this verse and coming from a very diverse background have made me appreciative uh, for the differences I see in people, their thoughts, their ideas, their lifestyles, and of course, their designs. I was born to a Palestinian Jordanian father and an Egyptian mother, and I have Turkish roots <laughs> from my grandmother. And I, um, you know, I, uh, was I lived for a few years with a step a Syrian stepmother, um, and that's all a combination of um, um, of a multicultural background. Um, through my life, I've been introduced to many cultures, uh, as Judy mentioned to you when she introduced me, and that helped me with the bless of God to build my character and to uh, to be the person I am today. Growing up, I loved drawings, uh, drawing, listening to classic music, playing piano, and of course, fashion, as everyone know, um, to the point I used to, uh, I learned how to uh, tailor my clothes to create my own design uh, that suits my personality. Also, since I was uh, the only daughter with two brothers, <laughs> I joined uh, them at some of their activities like soccer, martial arts. So my interests are very diverse as well. <laughs> Through the years, I was a confident girl um, who was moving forward with a nonstop rhythm. <laughs> my First career was in management when my dad decided to open a family business, which was a language institution in Jordan in 1995, where I worked as an executive manager. After three years from starting the business, my father passed away um, and I managed the business alone for a, one year. Then after that, <laughs> it was going well until my mom asked me to move to Egypt to stay with her. I had to secure the business with the good management and move to stay with my mother. And there I met my future husband. <laughs> then once I got married um, to that Egyptian kind young man, <laughs> my dear husband, Ahmed, um, and came here to the United States, uh, which was at the end of 1998. I dedicated my life since that time to raise my two children, Rosanna, she's 22 now, and Muhammad Adam, he's 18. Both are in college. <laughs> um, later, with um, when my um, both children started going to school, um, I realized I have a tremendous time, uh, a free time, and um, I don't know what to do with it other than cleaning and cooking. So I started like serving uh, at the school PTA, volunteering my time to support the students' activity. And in, the time, in that time only, I discovered my skills to decorate. So I started decorating the school hall for, you know, for events uh, and for with the different themes and styles. Um, from that experience, I started receiving requests from my friends um, for wedding and hall, de hall decoration, stage design. And at that time, they started encouraging me to start my own business. I started moving um, on very slowly and carefully, taking what I call um, concrete steps. 
uh, with the, the meeting is I like to always calculate my moves and have a solid base to stand on before taking the next step. Until the time came, I felt that my skills won't be fruitful enough, you know, without education. And at that time, an old friend of mine popped up into my life <laughs> and she was a um, God sent gift uh, to guide me through to start my interior design education at King University. I have received many encouraging words from friends. However, I received a bit pushback from others. Um, it was all about, you know, like you're always feeling safe being surrounded by a Muslim community, you know, like you're working with the Muslim students and families at the weekend school, you know, why would you go out and face the discrimination and not be treated fairly? Um, some people might look down to you, uh, think you're a terrorist <laughs> uh, or alienate you and so on of those words. <laughs> um, but since I'm a uh, since stubbornness is one of my characters sometimes, not all the time, I did not pay attention to what they said um, and had my mind fixed on, even if people think negatively about me, I can change this fact. The belief in me that if you have good intentions and do good yourself, to yourself and others, it will bring good, even if it shows otherwise. In the beginning and I was right. School time went great and I had all the support from my professors and class, uh, classmates. The negative turned into positive um, with the bless of God and with a beautiful smile in the morning. <laughs> I have to say um, that the only challenge for me uh, was brushing my rusty brain to start studying, memorizing, doing time-consuming projects, because I didn't know what to expect that back then. Um, it was a huge uh, time of work and effort. And uh, writing my essay was like a pain in the neck as well. Um, okay, I think I lost my notes, so <laughs> a second. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, However, remembering my, my dad's words to aim for perfection, and then I will be a little less than perfect because nobody is perfect. It pushed me to keep trying. And also my children played a huge role in my achievement. They were a great encouragement. Just by asking me one question, are you gonna get an A? <laughs> um, my husband, of course, was a wonderful supporter and my friends as well. Uh, I, re I really appreciate all of them. And I got it. I graduated from Kane and with a summa cum laude 2016 with a straight A and one B plus uh, on my script. <laughs> so my children, uh, they were proud of me and I felt I have set a good example for them. After graduating, I have waited a little bit, like few months to try to get a job. And I felt like um, all the, you know, like um, all the jobs requests, you know, uh, experience and otherwise, you know, like you're not gonna get a good, um, I don't know, a good position or like uh, find a job quickly. So um, I just went to seek my chances and I went to the company I used, I did my internship with, mm -hmm. uh, which is AK Architecture, the one I'm working with now. And I asked for training um, for a few months before I, you know, just to put it in my resume. So, um, and I have the knowledge of course, and uh, I did uh, training for six months and it was great, um, you know, it did widen my horizon in the, um, in, the, in the field of architecture, which relates to interior design. Um, then I started working uh, uh, at VHZ Design. I got a job at VHZ Design Group, which um, it was a great um, experience. Um, the designer was so kind and she taught me a lot about the business and how to run the business 
and the interior design as well. So this is my experience in the interior design when I worked uh, with BHZ design. Like I, I grew um, in uh, knowing the business and having the knowledge of uh, the practice of interior design. Then I got an offer of a full-time job at the AK Architecture, the company I did the training with. Um, so I moved you know, back to the AK Architecture and I have learned a lot. Now I've been like more than three years, I guess. <laughs> and um, I'm growing and I'm pleased uh, with wh where I am today. Um, and about having a seat on a table uh, for me as a Muslim, as uh, coming from a diverse background, I have a story with the ASID and it's a beautiful story. Um, I started, uh, Volunteering at the ASID, I, I became a member actually in 2013, and after that, a year from that time, I started volunteering as a student, and I got a lot of experience in uh, planning for events, uh, marketing, you know, for events. Uh, I did a lot of ne networking. It was very beneficial to me. Um, and later on, I started get, getting uh, positions uh, once I became a, an emerging professional. Um, and do, I, I think they appreciated my work. So I felt um, like I felt the ASID like a family to me. Um, I really appreciate um, the, the, the way they, they have dealt with me. Um, and I grew in the ASID through many uh, jumping from a different committee to a committee until I reached the uh, professional development uh, board of director. Um, and then I am right now, I'm the president elect for the next fiscal year. So I wish, you know, I wish I'll do good. <laughs> so uh, hopes and prayers. Uh, I hope I can pay back the organization what they have got me. Um, then there are times in my professional journey that I have felt some people's eyes uh, and thoughts were negative. It wasn't all like beautiful, but um, I used to, to totally ignore and do what my faith ordered me to do, act with dignity and honor and show mercy when, uh, but with being firm and strong at the same time. I don't argue with ignorance. And when I say ignorant, I don't mean it in the bad way. I mean it when people don't know you, they fear you. So we have to communicate with them and get to know them, show our good intentions and, and will. Um, and I think this will remove the fear and replace it with understanding and appreciation in some times. If they don't, <laughs> Then move forward and don't look back because looking back will cause cause everybody to trip and fall. That's basically my way of life and my way of work. Uh, I don't get so worried about um, or like wonder what if this happened, what if that happened. I just set my goal and move forward to the target with hope linked with God and that everything will go well and effort are not going to be wasted if it is with honorable and good manner. And I have a small advice for the students and emerging professionals. Um, I have mentioned it in before, you know, before in previous event, and I will say it again, because I feel like this is the, um, the energy that's keeping me moving forward. Do not fear the fact of being different. The fear is in your mind. Let it out. Just do what you have to do. Make effort. Knock the doors of the design world. Mm -hmm. Have patience. Don't wait for your chance to come. Go grab it by networking, communicating with uh, professionals. Introduce yourself. Show your work. Even if you have to go for a few months training, that's fine. You know, like you are moving forward instead of like staying at home and, you know, wondering if you're going to get a job. 
and do not expect a huge salary <laughs> in the beginning. Get some experience. It will leverage your status as a worker and will be an add on your resume as a designer. And I have also uh, an advice to the to all the industry leaders and professionals, uh, professional organization. Um, it's always try to include diverse members because you know diverse perspective can inspire creativity and drive innovation innovation um, and the, the diverse teams are more productive and uh, perform better it's also an opportunity you know for a personal and professional growth when we learn from each other so you might face <laughs> some challenges, which I have faced it myself during the work, even at the mosque with different, you know, cultures, because we have like almost 18 cultures in the mosque, <laughs> um, you know, like with the students. Um, so colleagues might, might um, from different uh, cultures may feel shy not to let their voice be heard. Um, so they don't speak out and they don't talk. So you have to pull the word out of them, uh, out of them and encourage them. Uh, the integration um, across the multicultural teams sometimes is difficult due to prejudice sometimes or due to a negative culture, cultural stereotypes. So you have to eliminate that and try to do your best. Communication can be difficult sometimes also um, to understand due to the lack of good knowledge uh, of the language. Sometimes we have, you know, like um, a saying or like, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, metaphors in Arabic. I cannot translate it to the English. Sometimes I might not understand the metaphors in English. So uh, I will like say uh, gibberish. <laughs> anyway, so we will try to you know, um, ask questions and get answers. Um, and um, the different work styles might cause also confusion sometimes. So um, my advice um, at the end and my way of life is patience and hard work is the key to success. And this is what I'm going for, success. I hope one day I will see my design you know, like uh, <laughs> my own my own um, signature as an Islamic artwork, maybe, or like apply it to um, a design here in the United States. This is my uh, dream one day that I will leave a footprint uh, as Nada Al Zabi, the Muslim lady, uh, who's um, a Palestinian, Jordanian, American. Uh, but we are all blending in this wall in the United States with all my brothers and sisters. I really appreciate everyone around and I really appreciate diversity. Salute to all and salam alaikum again. Peace be upon you. Alaikum salam. Yeah. That was I exceeded really, my time, I guess. <laughs> that was really wonderful, Nada. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce you to Tammy Bolden, Allied ASAD AKBD. She is the principal designer and owner of Bold Interior Designs, LLC, a full service residential and light commercial interior design firm specializing in renovation project management with emphasis on kitchen and bath design. Her design philosophy is Inspiration is everywhere. Design is for everyone. Make your personal statement. After spending 10 plus years working in various marketing, public relations, and sales capacities, including a tenure with a large furniture manufacturer, Tammy's passion for interior design could no longer be held at bay. She returned to school and earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Interior Design achieving cum laude honors from the Robert Bush School of Design at Kane University. She launched Bold Interior Designs after working for several high-end New York area designers who noted her ability for space planning and strength in working with color and texture. A strong advocate for mentoring, Tammy is a volunteer with court-appointed special advocates of Essex County, CASA, 
and a member of Impact 100 Essex. In 2001, she received the Female Entrepreneur of the Year from the Vashti School of Future Leaders Lead Out Loud program, where she served as a mentor and member of the board of directors. Can't hear you. Something happened. To... Yeah, something happened to the to your voice. Yeah, uh, we cannot I, hear you clearly. We're not hearing you. We're not hearing you. I'm sorry, Tammy. I can read it again. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy, for being with us today. We're so excited to hear you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. I actually have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, a lot of this is going to be repetitive because you just mentioned my bio, but um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Let me just pull this up really quickly. Uh oh. Wait a second. All right, share screen. There we go. Okay, so um, diversity in the interior design industry now and then. I'm Tammy Bolden, as um, Judy mentioned, the principal and owner of Bold Interior Designs. Um, I um, First of all, I just wanna talk a little bit about diversity. So what is diversity? Diversity is the practice of, oh my, this is in my way, let me pull this out there. The practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds and of different genders and sexual orientations. Is it not moving? So my journey into interior design, my background, I was born and raised in New Jersey. I am the oldest, the second oldest of six, three girls, three boys, and I'm the oldest girl. I'm married to the love of my life, Todd Bolden, for almost 33 years. And we have three beautiful children, Courtney and twins, uh, my daughter, Courtney, and twin sons, Jason and Steven. And I've been a resident of Montclair, New Jersey for nearly 30 years. I've always had a creative side, love to play with paper dolls, coloring books, and paint by numbers. Initially, I wanted to study fashion design in college since I love clothes and, and fashion and love to sew. I always got good grades in math and science in high school. So after doing some research, I decided I wanted to study architecture, which would kind of gel my, my create, creative side and my science and math aptitude. But my, my guidance counselor dissuaded me from studying architecture because she said there were no women architects and there's certainly no black female architects. And by the way, Mrs. Ware was black. So I attended Morgan State University in Baltimore to study engineering. Well, engineering in uh, math and science in high school is much different than math and science in college. And I studied engineering for one semester. <laughs> I just, it was my creative side that just, I have a, a you know, I'm just right brain. So it just didn't, it didn't work out. So. I ultimately earned a, a bachelor uh, degree in marketing from Kane University. I started my professional career in public relations, working for several nonprofit organizations. I worked for United Way, Urban League of Essex County, um, the Volunteer Center of Essex County. And then after having my sons, I was a homemaker. I discovered interior design after we've purchased our first home. I started perusing uh, magazines, and this was at the time when HGTV came onto the scene. So I felt I was hooked. I was I I figured out what my my passion was, and I felt like it related to architecture. So there was a, a good a good mix there. Um, after I went back to work, 
I worked for a furniture manufacturer in uh, retail store management. And then I got a promotion to contract sales manager for Northern New Jersey. Um, after a terrible re-engineering that went, went completely south, it was just awful, the company went belly up. So I decided I still wanted to have some kind of access to homes and design and architecture. So I became a real estate agent and I did that for, for nearly 10 years, but I was so unhappy. I really did not enjoy that at all. So in 2006, I went through some really tough times with my family. My father had a massive stroke. Both of my grandparents passed away and I just said to myself, life is too short. So I talked to my husband and with his support, he said, go back to school, get your degree. So in 2007, I returned to school to study interior design. And in 2010, earned a bachelor's degree from Kane University, Robert Bush School of Design. And I graduated magnum cum laude. Um, after, well, even actually in design school, I interned for DRP Interiors and worked there uh, for about a year after, uh, after I graduated from Kane. Um, they were originally located in Montclair, but then she uh, moved her business to Bergen County. And then I started working for Mason Barrister Interiors, which was in Livingston at the time. And that just wasn't a good fit for me. Um, being a woman of a certain age, as they say, um, I had a certain salary expectation and I, and I didn't feel like my talents were really being, being utilized. And so I said, you know what, at this point in my life, I think I can do this. I'm just gonna go ahead out there and do it on my own. Um, and so I launched my own business. That was a rough time for me. <laughs> it was it was it was a challenge trying to get off the ground. Um, you know, being a, a having a second career, being in an industry that the majority of the people didn't look like me. I just had a really hard time. Um, you know, getting projects and 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 moving forward in my career. And, and also my children were ready to go to college. So I started working for Ethan Allen in New York City. I did that for about three years. And um, that job, as a design consultant, I should say, but that job was really more sales focused than design focused. And it just wasn't, again, a good fit for me. Um, so I decided to leave and I went back to work for myself in 2000, the end of 2017. And this time, I think I had more experience under my belt. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of volunteer work, so I knew a lot of people and things just started to, to happen. And to this day, I mean, it's just, you know, I just decided to go out there, do it. If it was meant to be, it would happen. And it did. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I made that choice to go back. Um, and I've been working ever since. So my professional background, I'm an a, uh, allied member of ASID, uh, an associate member of NKBA. I'm a member of the Black Interior Designers Network and a past member of the IIDA. I was, I have a strong advocacy for, I'm sorry, I'm a strong advocate for volunteerism and mentoring as um, Judy mentioned. Um, I've done tons of volunteer work because to me, I believe to whom much is given, much is required. That's my life model. And so, you know, whether it's young people, um, minorities, whomever needs a hand, I feel like whatever I have within my wheelhouse to give back, it's very important to me. I'm also a preacher's kid, a PK, as they call them. Uh, my mother's a minister. So that's, you know, helping others is ingrained in my, in my DNA, if you will. So I've done, as you can see, I've done a lot of volunteer work, but I'm proudest to say that I've just joined the board of directors for New Jersey chapter of American uh, Society of Interior Designers as the professional development director. So what is diversity in design? Diversity of experience, perspective and creativity, otherwise known as diversity of thought. And these can be shaped by multiple factors, including race, ethnicity, gender, age, sexual identity, ability or disability, and location, among other things. 
So this is just a, a, a little graph that shows the uh, makeup of interior designers. Um, as you can see, male is only about 16%, uh, female 84% um, for practicing interior designers. For students, it's about uh, female about 89% and male about 11%. But the ethnicity, you'll see that they are, are about 80% uh, white and then less, you know, a little bit more than 20% of other races. But the student population, as you can see, there's a, there's a uh, difference there in that there's about 64% white and then the rest other minorities. So that tells you that there is a growing population or the, the population towards interior designers is growing and it's very, very diverse. And these stats come from the ASID 2021 Outlook and State of Interior Design Report. So the key insights from this report, diversity within the design industry and profession must continue to be an urgent matter as the demographics of the nation shift. According to the US Census in 2000, individuals who identify as Hispanic accounted for 14% of the population. And in, in 2019, that number reached 23%, 70% increase over that period. Over the same time, the number of individuals who identify as white decreased from 81% to 76% of the population. So that just shows you that the population is shifting. The, the population is becoming much more diverse. And we as a design industry need to keep up with that. And it needs to reflect. We need to re be able to reflect the population that we serve. The power of diverse thought, background, and experience that interior designers apply in understanding people and their behaviors can only increase the positive impact they have on user experience. So as I mentioned, the, the students, the graduates, I'm sorry, of interior design degrees has continued to decline. The student population shows more diversity than practicing designers. However, the profession needs to work collectively to support emerging, emerging talent to be successful interior designers. And Jeffrey mentioned some of the organizations that are really um, helping to build the community of diverse designers. Black Interior Designers Network, LA IDEA, which is Latin American Interior Designers, Engineers and Architects Committee, National Organization for Minority Architects, and then Badge Black Artists and Interior Design, I'm sorry, Black Artists and Designers Guild. These are organizations that promote community amongst diverse populations. And these are very important for, for you know, emergency professionals and students to get involved in so that they can be around other uh, designers or professionals who look like them, who can encourage them. This is a, a, a quote from Keisha Franklin, who's a very, very talented designer, who's really um, one of the shining stars in the design industry right now. And, I, and, and I, I mean, this quote, I think just says it all really, for me at least, I'm not looking for special treatment because I'm a black designer. I'm looking for equal treatment because I'm good at what I do. So my role as professional development director for ASID New Jersey is to address the needs of current membership, especially profession, emerging professionals and student members. These are the future, this is the future of our organization. We've got to make sure that, you know, people who are on the come up, as they say, really feel like their needs are being addressed, whether it's through programming, CEUs, um, you know, mentorship, whatever it is that they feel that they need to be successful, to keep that gap from widening, to, from the, 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 the gap of uh, students to practicing, uh, practicing design, excuse me. I also wanna create relevant and important programs to assist in the professional development of the membership, including, and in particular, uh, call, uh, designers of color, excuse me. And this is because again, you know, we're seeing that the population is so diverse, we've gotta keep up um, and make sure that we again, address the needs of 
of uh, designers of color. Representation matters. This is a slide that I found that I was so happy to be able to see because a lot of these visionaries I had never heard of before. Um, you know, I know of Paul Williams and uh, Cecil Hayes and Kim, actually Kimberly Ward was a friend of mine, um, but all these other people, these are people from, who have a history of developing and um, enhancing our industry by their tremendous work. And they're just not known about, unfortunately. You know, as uh, Jeffrey mentioned, we know of Albert Hadley and Elsa DeWolf and Do uh, Dorothy Draper, but these are some luminaries that, you know, they're just not, they're not known, but we need to know that um, you know, these people came before us that we as designers of color stand on their shoulders um, to help us understand that we can achieve and do anything that we want in this industry as long as we put in the hard work and, and persevere. And again, now the, these are some designers that everyone has heard of. Celery Campbell, Mary McDonald, Kelly Wurstler, Vincent Wolf, who is of Latin descent, but still, you know, there's not a lot of, um, you know, of people that, um, you know, I'm sorry, that the, these are some of the people that are out there now that um, people know of, but a lot of other people don't know about, you know, Justina Blakely. She um, has a line with Target now. Um, Bridget Romanek, she just launched a line with um, Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams. And Mikhail Welch has a, quite a few endorsements. So, you know, again, we see these, those folks up top all the time, but we don't know about all these wonderful designers who are doing great things. Um, uh, but again, if we learn and follow their careers and figure out what they did to uh, become successful, that's just gonna help our diverse population in our industry. Diversity, and art and design cannot be just a hot media topic that's on par with the current political climate, only to vanish after the buzz dies down. Diversity is not just transactional, but it's also about building genuine relationships with all the players in an industry. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy. That was very inspiring. I appreciate you sharing that with us. All right, everyone. Um, next up, we have um, MJ Davino, allied ASID, RA, AIA, IDEC, Associate IIDA. He serves as a lecturer and chair of the Interior Design Department at Robert Bush School of Design at Michael Graves College, Kane University. MJ has been an architect, interior designer, and educator since 1996. Prior to his role at Kane University, he taught at Berkeley College. MJ has worked for several a and firms in the New York, New Jersey area, and currently co-owns MK Davino Interiors LLC with his wife, Mary, who is also an interior designer. MJ received a bachelor's in architecture from Washington University, St. Louis in 1994 and a master's in architecture from the University of Michigan in 1996. He is currently studying for the NCIDQ. MJ is a strong believer in the experiential storytelling and human aspects of architecture and design and tries to embody those concepts in his work and in his lessons to his students. MJ is also determined to foster a community of diversity, inclusion, and equity in all aspects of the profession. He believes that good design is a right, not a privilege, that belongs to every human being, no matter their place in society. Great. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, nice to see, I can't see anybody's faces, but it's nice to see a lot of familiar names. 
Um, and I wanted to start off by saying that, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about my experience as a professional, not so much as an educator. Um, you know, because this, this talk is really uh, directed towards the, the professionals and students alike. Um, but most people don't, re my students don't realize that, you know, I worked before I uh, became a teacher. So, you know, I'm also here to represent um, a certain uh, demographic that um, is typically underrepresented, but that's also many different types of um, groups. You know, I could, so I could talk about Asians, I could talk about Asian Americans. I could talk about Filipino Americans. I could talk about architects who are interior designers, which is a minority. I could talk about the male component of interior design, which is also a minority. I could also talk about being Catholic and uh, being in interior design. And so, you know, really of all those things, you know, that demographic, any one of those demographics is, is, is basically the second lowest represented of the groups in interior design, probably the only um, social group that is has less representation is Native Americans and Pacific Islanders. Okay, so all of that is to say that you know my whole life has been a microcosm of, or I should say, my experience in interior design has been a microcosm of what my experience with diversity has been my entire life which is to say that I don't really feel like I've ever belonged anywhere. And I've also felt like I've belonged everywhere. Um, I grew up in Edison, New Jersey, which is one of the most diverse places, one of the most diverse, diverse places in the whole entire world. Uh, we have huge populations of almost every ethnic group. But as Jeffrey mentioned in his talk um, earlier, um, those groups aren't necessarily integrated. And I experienced that through every level of school and then high school, college, um, you, you name it. And so, you know, growing up, I had friends who were Chinese and black and white and Korean and Filipino, all these, all these different kinds of groups. And it was great, but I also never really felt like I belonged to any of them. But like I said, because I was always surrounded by diversity, it, it felt like I belonged everywhere. Now, coming into talking about where I am now, I think a lot of the, the things that make me think about diversity are about how sometimes I feel like I have been placed into that stereotype of the model, the model minority which, you know, if you've ever heard that term, is actually very derogatory towards Asians or anybody who's, who's you know, can be labeled the model minority. Um, even, you know, Nada mentioned the fact that a lot of people don't have the, um, you know, whatever it takes to, to speak up for themselves a lot of times. That's actually an Asian characteristic, which is that you don't question authority. Right, that's how most of us were raised. Is that you know, if you're in school, or if you're at work, and you know, you there's a figure of an, of authority, you're not supposed to challenge them. Whereas in America, that's different. I I, I saw some stupid um, thing on Instagram the other day that said, you know, the uh, a white parent when when a child comes home to a white parent, the the parents will ask them. Um, you know, what did you say to your, what did you say to your teachers today? And for most other ethnicities, especially in the Asian, it's like, you're not, you're not supposed to talk to your, to your superiors. So you now I grew up under the whole uh, thought process that, you know, I'm sure I'm just supposed to sit there and be told what to do. And I think that that's what, I feel the, the majority of Asian people are kind of uh, corralled into thinking that that's what they're supposed to do, right? We're called the model minority because we don't make noise. We're not supposed to make noise. And I think for the longest time I lived under that and I was fine with it until I wasn't. And of course it all came to a head 
as a professional. Um, I was always a good student and I just happened to be good at math and science, all the stuff that we're supposed to be good at. And so when I got into the work world, I got easily and quickly pigeonholed into being a CAD person. Now, it's funny, my students know, like I teach CAD. CAD is like one of my favorite things to teach. But because I was so good at it in the jobs that I had, that's all anybody want, wanted me to do. So within, you know, six months of being working at a place, I became the CAD jockey. And not because people didn't see that I had potential or anything like that. It's just that, you know, the jobs needed to be done. Give it to MJ. He'll finish, he'll finish it quick. He'll get it out. He'll hit the deadline. And so, you know, when we were told to prepare something to talk about here, we were, we were, we were told to ask the question, how did you get a seat at the table? And I have to say that I got a seat at the table because I asked for it. And then I demanded it. And then I took it. Because for somebody that is perceived as supposed to be submissive and obedient, that is the only way that you can do it, right? Nobody is going to take a person like that and say, that guy over there who was just doing CAD drawings before, make him a partner, right? That's not going to happen. It has to be the person stepping up and saying, no, I don't want to do CAD drawings anymore. I want to design something. Or no, I don't want to just be a designer. I want to be a partner at this firm, right? Or no, I don't want to just be a partner. I want to be the owner of this firm. And so year by year, experience by experience, I got more and more confidence in being able to do that. At first it was just, you know, I would see people in the firm who weren't holding up their, they weren't holding their weight in the firm but they were above me, right? Making more money than me, whatever it is. And so I would say, or I would wait until I had the opportunity and say, I can do that person's job. And I would ask, you know, if, if that person needs to be replaced, I would like to replace that person. And one time, and I, I, I have this, this conversation with my, with my students all the time. One time I asked for how much money I thought I was worth when in the past I would have no inclination to do that whatsoever. And I know you young guys out there, <laughs> you are so afraid to demand what you're worth. You cannot. Now I did my research and I, at the time, you know, the, the going salary for, you know, whatever level I was, was, was like about $60,000. And I knew that I was valuable to the, my company. I walked into the office and I said, I want $90,000. They gave it to me. And then I was like, I should have asked for more, shouldn't I? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I had to purposely break out of the mold of being the submissive Asian American guy who sits in the corner and just does his CAD drawings. And if I didn't, I would never be in the place that I am now. Now, again, I'm only speaking about the professional side of things uh, because um, on the educational side of things, um, I was noticed and well, I did ask, but I was noticed and I got pulled into the whole world of education at the same time. But I, was, I really want to, to tell one, one story that I think kind of sums up where, where I'm currently at. You know, what, at my first trip out of the uh, pandemic I should say we're still in the pandemic. My first trip out of quarantine was uh, to Newport, Rhode Island. This is the trip we just did a couple of months ago this summer with my wife and my two kids. Um, and we went to Newport, you know, Newport, Rhode Island is famous for the mansions. And the most famous one is the Breakers, right? Owned by the Vanderbilts. And if you read all the plaques or whatever, you learn that the Vanderbilts gained their fortune through the railroad industry. Now, what most people don't realize is that Asians and Asian Americans have experienced a great amount of atrocities. Uh, no, not nearly as much as, you know, uh, Jewish populations, the black population, 
but there is a lot that happened that was really, really negative for Asian Americans. And one of the biggest um, recordings of that was how the Chinese workers built the railroads. And, you know, the Chinese were taken advantage of. They were paid less than their equivalent uh, white workers. And then when the railroads were finished, uh, what happened was that the United States uh, basically placed a ban on all Asians uh, immigrating into the United Sorry, they, they placed a ban on Chinese coming into the States, right? But then when too many Japanese people came in, they, they placed another ban. Then when people from India, right? You, go, you name the country, whatever, they were discouraged from coming into the country, whether you call it a quota, whether you call it an act, whatever it was. And those Asian populations were also relegated to ghettos and you know, places in the country where it was not a pleasant place to live. So really, when you say that the Vanderbilts made their fortune on the railroads, they made their fortune on the backs of the Chinese workers who built the railroads. And you're not going to see any kind of plaque about that in any of the mansions that are over there. So what people see as great design, yeah, the breakers is beautiful, but it's also opulence. And what you have to realize about opulence is that it, it comes at the cost, a huge cost to somebody and usually a large group of people. Right, there's more of this too, World War II when the Japanese were incarcerated. And now for the fact that it is, we're in this time of COVID, of course, um, there's been a great deal of Asian and Asian American uh, discrimination uh, because, because of that as well. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, lost my train of thought. I think what I wanted to come here to talk about as well was the fact that, you know, I think it's great that a lot of places are coming out and saying, yeah, diversity, equality, inclusion. But at this point, it's a lot of lip service. Now, with interior design, what's important to note is that if you say, okay, let's diversify the profession, it's not like minorities are sitting in the alleyways waiting to be hired. They just, they don't, there's not enough of us to make that kind of a difference. What has to happen is that it has to start at the educational level, not just college, but high school, right? If we want more black and Hispanic and Asian and um, Arabic and Muslim and whatever, whatever minorities to start diversifying the profession, we have to start getting to the young people who are making up their minds about where to go with their careers in the first place. Now, I know when I was in high school, I never heard the term interior design, right? So when people, heard, when people thought that I could draw and I was good at math, they immediately pushed me to architecture. There wasn't a single person who said, hey, what about architecture or interior design? And now when I talk to high school students now, if they show any kind of talent towards our field, if they're female, they're pushed towards interior design. If they're male, they're pushed towards architecture. And that's not even some, you know, maybe there's, some, no. If you're a male, you go to an architect, you're, you're encouraged to do architecture. If you're a woman, you're encouraged to do interior design. We need to get into the high school levels to tell them that this is a possibility. Interior design is a real possibility to have a, lust, um, a lucrative and exciting and creative career. Most people, most kids don't know that. And, you know, sorry to say, but HGTV is not doing us any favors. What we see on HGTV is not what we do. It's not a good representation uh, of what re real interior design is. Um, 
Now, one of the things that I think is um, on the positive side of this is that, you know, as uh, Jeffrey had mentioned, you know, the numbers in the profession are very different than the numbers of uh, the students in school. Now, I can, of course, I can only talk about Kane University, but um, whereas, as uh, Tammy's graph, or sorry, t t statistics showed, uh, whites represent, I think it was something like 79% of the interior design profession. At Kane, actually, um, it's much lower, where all the minor minorities put together are actually the majority. So at Kane, I'm proud to say that we, you know, we buck the trend of what the demographics of an interior des of, of the interior design profession is. Yeah, you know, I'm very proud of that. But the fact of the matter is, there's still a lot of work to do uh, to get that diversity in the pro in interior design as the profession um, overall. Uh, so what I would like to do is end with my, uh, I guess, advice or conclusions, if you could say. And the best thing to do, I think, is to be curious about the people who are different from you. I think a lot of times we, you know, if you're in a room with, if you're in a room by yourself and then two people walk in, one of them looks like you and one of them doesn't, you're actually going to judge both people, right? And you're not going to question the person who looks like you, but you are going to question the person who doesn't look like you. So my advice is that you need to be curious about everybody, right? Don't make assumptions about somebody, even if they do look like you. Don't make a such assumption about people just because they don't look like you. And especially don't ask the question, and I, I got this my whole entire life, what are you? <laughs> people will actually come up to me and say, what are you? And what are you talking about? What am I? I'm a person, okay? The best thing to do is not even to ask what's your ethnicity. Just say, what's your name? For a lot of people, you can tell a whole hell of a lot about them just by knowing what their name is. Now, if you talk about too, um, especially in the Asian, um, in the Asian world, of course, most people think Asian just means China, Japan, and Korea but Asia is so, so much more than that. So if you find, find out somebody's name and you do a little tiny bit of research, you'll be easily be able to tell if they are Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, um, Mongolian, Thai, Vietnamese, Indonesian. Our names are very different. So at any time, again, I, I, I think really the, the basis of it is how you need to look at yourself and evaluate how do you react when you see somebody that is different than you. The person who is truly into diversity, who is about diversity, and I'll say it, is not a racist, is the one who actually values somebody that is different than them, right? Somebody who, who celebrates the fact that here's another person that can make my life better because they, they represent something completely that I am not, right? So if you, if you don't allow that into your own personal life, our companies and our firms and our industry, we're not gonna go anywhere. We have to be accepting not even, it has to be more than accepting. We have to be welcoming, encouraging of that difference. We have to crave that, 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 uh, that amount of difference to be in all of the places where we go to school, where we work, right? Every place that we are. Now that's a big ask, but as I learned from all my past experiences, I'm not afraid of the big ask anymore, right? We're not gonna get anywhere without the big ask. So that's my talk. And I, before I go, I wanted to give out a, sh a shout out to uh, my son, who's actually on the 
uh, on the call here. So I, I know there's one person who's in the same demographic as me because he's my son. <laughs> uh, but that's all I got for you guys. I hope you uh, take what I say with a grain of salt. And uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll see some more when uh, we get to the questions. Thanks, everyone. That was great, MJ. Thank you so much for um, shedding light on some really important topics for us. Um, we have one more panelist for you. We're really excited to announce Lisbeth Jimenez, ASID, IIDA, NCIDQ, Well AP. She is an associate design professional at TPG Architecture, LLP, as well as a teacher in New York City. She joined TPG Architecture in 2016 with a background in residential and commercial design. Lisbeth challenges herself to produce exceptional transformational design concepts, creating beneficial spaces that positively impact her clients and their environment. Her most recent contributions include Newsday's corporate headquarters on Long Island, Outside of work, Lisbeth participates in interior design pro bono projects and has designed spaces for a number of nonprofit organizations. She believes making a difference in someone's life through interior design services is more impactful when the act of your services is directly focused on changing someone's life. Welcome, Elizabeth. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. <laughs> Welcome, Elizabeth. Just muted myself here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And um, very hard to follow the former panelists, but happy to be here. And I want to start by saying that I'm grateful to have this opportunity, as I've never had the chance to really tell my story like this before. Never had to stop to think about my life in general. <laughs> until I had to you know, put this presentation today. And um, to put it into perspective, I am very proud of where I am and what I have been able to accomplish as a professional and in my life. But I do believe that I am where I am because of the many support that I have been given throughout my career. And I would not have been able to be where I am if it wasn't for the great teachers and role models that I've had in my life. And I'm confident that we cannot accomplish anything on our own. So I'm thankful for all my wonderful mentors. To take a step back, I was born in Manhattan, but I was raised in the Dominican Republic. I did not have a very stable living environment. So I will move very often. I remember once counting how many schools I've been to um, in my life, and it was over 20, 20 different schools because of how often uh, me and my family moved. Um, and I also did not really grow up surrounded by college educated adults, but I knew that I wanted an education and I wanted to be uh, in a creative field. As I completed my freshman year in high school in the Dominican Republic, I knew that I did not, I knew that I had to come to the state for uh, a pre-college program, whether it was high school, before coming into the States to pursue my American dream to become an interior designer. And so I asked my mom, and she agreed to move us here. So we packed our bags and we moved to New Jersey, to Bergen County. And to give you a sense of the kind of student I was since uh, high school, which will give you uh, also a sense of the ability that I had to quickly adapt to different environments. I came uh, to the United States you know, after I was born. Um, and after living in the Dominican Republic in sophomore year high school, knowing zero English, I took an, e an ESL or an English test that placed me in uh, you know, the lowest level of ESL, which was ESL one. 
I then went on to skip two levels of ESL and by my senior year, I was placed in honors English. I did have the drive to be the best because I felt like I was playing catch up. My mom would always tell me, make sure to get an education so that you don't have to rely on men. And no offense on men, but my biological father was not a free role model. So for, for lack of a better word, and he'll never watch this, so don't worry. <laughs> um, Despite my, my success in, in English class in high school, one of the things that I still struggle with is uh, public speaking or you know speaking in English in general because my vocabulary I consider to still be limited. Um, so when I grew here, you know, great speakers, everybody that spoke before me, I am always in awe as to how you're all able to elaborate your words so thoughtfully. Um, my advice for people who are struggling with the same issues that I am um, when speaking, you know, a different language that you did not grow up speaking is what my Taekwondo instructor used to tell me. He used to say, um, take a pause. Don't hesitate to take a pause. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, saying um or like, he would always ask us to pause mm -hmm. instead. And, you know, I've used that. Uh, to guide me through my professional career so that when I'm presenting to my clients, I, I take a pause knowing that people are more understanding than, than we think. And of course, preparing um, or practicing, it's always helpful, which takes me through my next slide. So by the time my mother met my stepfather during my senior year in high school. I finally had um, an educated person in, in my life and as a role model. He had migrated to this country um, also during high school and he came with a scholarship from Peru. And my stepfather, he was a math teacher he actually taught at Keene University and GIT and a state count, uh, community college. And uh, he's now retired in Florida, but still teaching because he does also have a passion for teaching. Well, the one thing that he used to tell me was uh, this quote that he would tell me about, I have no idea who, whose quote this is, but I just remember it from, from him telling me, uh, chance favors a prepared mind. He would tell me, as long as I'm prepared for something, I will have a higher chance at succeeding. And I really took this to heart. And one example I remember going to the office of the chair of the interior design department at FIT one summer before the semester ended. And I told, um, well, his name is Andrew Seifer. So he was a chair at the time. I said, I heard the construction documents class is one of the most challenging ones. Can I please borrow a book? And, you know, I was one of those students that couldn't afford a book. So I would always borrow or, you know, take it from the library. And he, to this date, tells me the story every time I see him, that he couldn't understand why I would want to take that book and, and study it over the summer. But I did it with the intention of preparing for the class that I had ahead so that I can succeed better. And I have a, a copy of this book here. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. This is the Time Saver Standard for Interior Design and Space Planning. <laughs> so I went through this book in detail during the summer and I did have a successful construction documentation class. And I believe till this day, uh, my professor, my former professor still uses my, my construction document set as an example. So fast forward to graduation. I graduated at the top of my class. I was actually the only summa cum laude student in my entire uh, department. And won the SUNY Chancellor's Award and most department awards. But I credit my drive of having a prepared mind 
for my successful education career. That said, I think it is very important to have some guidance and mentors in your life. And I try to be that for my own students at FIT and at the new school. And I would like to extend my mentorship to any students that may be listening, that may be looking for some guidance. On to the next slide. While I was at FIT, I had five jobs. And some of them to gain experience in the industry, hoping to be able to get a job after I graduate, but most of them were to be able to afford school. And I still find time to volunteer to design homes. And we started with uh, what we call the Interior Design Relief Project after Hurricane Sandy. And we helped design homes for the victims that didn't know where to start, um, where they had um, just destroyed homes. And I worked with uh, Carmita, who's now the chair of the Interior Design Department. And she was my role model at FIT. As a fellow Latina and the kindest human I've ever met. We started volunteering together to design nonprofit organizations like the Vara Mission Centers, St. Paul's House, and Restore New York City, and have continued to work together till this day. We're actually currently looking into pursuing a community center project in Engle, in Engle, New Jersey. So anyone let me know if you want to volunteer. I feel like my experiences have led me to be very comfortable um, in the position that I am in my industry. From helping so many people during my pro bono projects, I already knew that my values, I already knew what my values were as a designer. And when I started my professional career, I have always been confident with my skills. I think that I was still feeling like I needed to catch up. Rather than waiting for someone to give me a job or tell me what to do, I've always been the type of person to be like, this is what I can do. This is my experience. How can I help you? How can we work together? And as an example, at TPG, I was able to gather the partners. And what I meant for, for this gathering is for me to design what well, my, my, my success mean. And so I led the conversation with saying that I define my success by the amount of difference that I make in the environments that I enhance. And yes, a title is nice and a healthy salary is also nice, but what really drives you and makes you happy with your job is what really makes a difference in your life. Soon after my presentation, I was able to represent TPG on NBC's George to the Rescue TV show, where I had the opportunity to help beautiful young lady um, that was in need of a renovation. And we were able to make her home accessible, which it wasn't prior. And like the mentors I had throughout my life, my intention is to pass on the values that I have learned from my mentors and my own life experiences to my teammates and students whenever I get the opportunity. As we're all in this role as one species, evolving together and every decision we make today individually affects our tomorrow as a whole. With that, I inspire everyone to define their success beyond their titles and salary. And I'm hopeful to continue to see events like this one that, enc that encourages collaboration and networking amongst like-minded individuals, but with different backgrounds. Uh, as um, we come from different backgrounds and different experiences, I feel that we can learn more from one another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, your English is fabulous. And um, that was so inspiring. Thank you. Okay, um, so next, 
Um, we're going to have some um, questions and answers moderated by our program co-chair, uh, Elena Spina, who is a allied ASID. Uh, she's our chair of the program commi programs committee for the 2020 to 2021 year for ASID New Jersey. She honed in her love of skills for working with people during her first career as an HR senior manager. Although she enjoyed the challenges of her responsibilities, Elena recognized the need to reconnect with her artistic side, especially her appreciation of beautiful and functional interiors. Elena left the HR world in 2016 and enrolled in Berkeley College in Woodland Park, New Jersey, from which she graduated in 2019 with the BFA in interior design. Shortly after graduation, the pandemic interrupted and, and anticipated employment opportunities in her new career path. Undaunted by the turn of events, Elena used the time to refine her portfolio and looks forward to securing a position with a design firm. Ms. Spina's design focus is to apply her corporate experience to create workplaces that are practical and aesthetically pleasing for the time spent away from home and to make the residents to which clients return comfortable, eye-pleasing and reassuring refuges, all within budget. She is dedicated to the drive for diversity in the interior design industry with a special interest in the Latino experience. Elena has been a member of ASID New Jersey for five years and has served on the program committee since 2019. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Judy. Um, before we start the Q&A, um, Nadal wanted just to show her slides that she has. Uh, she forgot to do it when she was presenting. So Nadal, you're on mute. Thank you, Elena. You're welcome. Okay. All right. All right. Um, as you can see, this is me, a diva, when I was young. And I'm just going to go really quickly. I'm not going to talk that much. This is me when I came to the United States and with my daughter. My graduation. It's just a few pictures to vis for you to visualize my life. Uh, moving forward. And this is my family and my friends. This is the school I founded uh, in 2011 and still uh, working so far. We're beginning the registration and the school will start in October. So all hopes and prayers <laughs> for a good year. This is the staff. This is my community in Maplewood where we do multicultural events for women. And this is one of our events. This is one of human rights advocate advocacy. And this is me advocating for human rights also as well. Meeting representatives, discussing um, cases and bills. <laughs> This is the vote. <laughs> this is my daughter first voting <laughs> when she first got to uh, vote. And we, so I appreciate the, the moment. This is our vote day. We were voting for uh, um, Myla JC. Our, this is the Essex County uh, people. So um, I just thought to have uh, some images. This is one of my designs. You know, this is just an idea of what I used, my inspiration to get me into the uh, study of interior design. And this is me at AK Architecture working at the site, in the site visit. And this is my team at AK Architecture. We did our birthday. We're all, all birthdays are in April. So we did the birthday, that's basically it. And this is my beautiful family, which I'm living for them. <laughs> and um, 
that's about it for you to know um, a glimpse about my life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Nada, for that. Um, you and MJ had said um, something about a, a seat at the table. You know, having a seat at the table is more than just being at that table. It's having your, your voice heard and um, being part of the conversation. Now, do you think that minority employees being given opportunities to have a voice and be visible? That's the question. Are those minority employees being given opportunities to have a voice and be visible within the design industry? Uh, in my experience, again, you know, based on what I've gone through, no, I think, I mean, it's that's a, a broad statement to say for a very broad question. Um, but in my experience, I, I don't think um, minorities speak up for themselves enough. And I think what, what also happens is that um, opportunities get passed by because minorities don't speak up for themselves. And then the people that who are, you know, given those, giving those opportunities are saying, well, you know, I, 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 I asked and they didn't say anything. So um, they didn't, they didn't get the job or they didn't get the promotion or whatever it was. So being, being able to introduce um, self-advocacy for minorities is a very important thing for, for firms. You know, again, you, you can't just say, well, we're gonna do more diverse things. It's, it's way more than that because what, you're, what you have is an integration of, or a failure to integrate cultures within a particular company or within the industry. Can I piggyback on MJ's comment? I I agree with um, with what you're saying in regards to the confidence. I think it it's all in the confidence of somebody just speaking out. Because from my experience, I feel that the firms that I have worked for and the leaders that I have had the chance to work with have always been open to me um from my experience at least to doing things and 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 if i had the feeling that i was going to be pigeonholed to do you know just revit just because i'm a revit teacher uh, i've always said you know this is actually not what i am here to do i want to be a designer and they've always been uh, understanding and and i think it's it's really on on the sense that the designers should be really speaking out more as to what they they want to do. If I can jump in on that, um, if you don't mind, I found that I had to create the opportunity for myself. Um, this was a second career for me. When I was in design school, I was in my, 40s. <laughs> I was like a mother figure for a lot of the students. And I realized that, again, having a family and having worked, I wasn't going to make the kind of money that I was used to. And, and I was okay with that until I got out there and realized how much work it was that I needed to do, how much was involved. And I was like, I can't work for this. I, I can't. I and mean, I'm not. Maybe if I were in my 20s, I would. But at 40 something, I was like, nope, not doing it. And so I created the opportunity for myself by starting my own firm. Now, everybody may not have the bandwidth for that, but that was my path. You know, and I and I'm glad I did. I mean, I took a little, you know, I had to um take a few diversions and go different paths. But I ultimately came back to, um, you know, working for myself because that was the best thing for me. So sometimes you just have to create your own opportunities, whatever that may be. If it's in a, if you work for a firm and they're, they're giving you all the CAD drawings, maybe you can, you know, um, 
if there's a need in the company, you know, talk to someone about creating a, a position for that suits your talents. You know, I mean, it may work in a small firm, not in a big firm, but you know, you just gotta, you've got to go for it. You've got to, you've got to be willing to take the chance um, because, you know, as a minority or as a woman, um, a lot of times you're not going to be just, you're not going to be their priority, you know, the company's priority for, um, you know, uh, for them, but you've got to be your own advocate, so. Okay. Um, Nadar, do you have anything to add? I second all the opinions. Okay. <laughs> well, so my next question is, <laughs> What are the basic changes in the industry you know, with organizations who represent designers need to make so that it does feel safe and welcoming to all? I don't think I'm sorry. sorry, can you repeat the question? Elena? Sure. What are the basic changes in, in the industry and with organizations who represent designers need to make so that it does feel safe and welcoming to all? I don't think there's enough organizations. I mean, you you know, you have ASID, which is a national organization, and you know, IIDA and IF, IFDA. But on the, um, I guess if you, organizations that are focused primarily on certain demographics, I don't think there there are enough. And I think that you know, when I was doing my research for my PowerPoint, you know, I knew of badge and I knew of um, Black Interior Designers Network, but when I tried to research on other, you know, my uh, other um, ethnicities, I could only find, honestly, one other. And so we have to create, we being people of color, have to create those organizations for ourselves, to for community. And, and, and I think I said that in my, my PowerPoint, community is important to feel that you have people who understand your plight or your position to help you achieve, you know, and don't let um, whatever perceived as um, a hindrance keep you from moving forward. When you have like-minded people, you know, you can achieve, anything when you put your mind when you put your minds together for a common goal I, I would add too that you know I've been working since 1996 and you know it's been that several firms and I've only ever had one employer that was not white and so you know if you want to talk about how do you change you know what's going on in the industry is that you you have to get those leaders on board with, with diversity. And again, you know, I said before that I think a lot of it right now is just lip service. So you have to get those people to, to go beyond lip service and you know, really figure out ways to, to diversify the, the industry. Right, because it's more than just checking a box and right. saying, hey, I have an African-American at the table, you know, I'm diverse. It's, you know, it's not enough to say that we have you know, X number of black and brown employees at our, our, our company or X amount of Latinas or Latinos at this company. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's the lip service. Like you have to, you know, talk to talk, you need to walk the walk. And do you guys feel that companies are actually putting the work in to d uh, diversify the organizations and the companies um, that designers work at? Well said. You've got to pull people in to organizations. You know, you encourage, you know, if you know that a company has an opening, you've got to encourage people to go for it. You know, you've got to, if you know that there's a talented um, designer of color uh, out there who's looking for work, push them, you know, and, 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 or if you work in a company, you've got to pull people along with you. That's the only way that organizations are going to get diverse. And when I mean organizations, I mean companies, you know, um, we've got to kind of almost demand that you follow what the trend of the country is. You know, the country, this, this, the browning of the, of the United States is happening. 
and companies need to look like the population. You know, I just want to, Elaine Griffin, I would have shared this quote tonight, but I didn't have time. Elaine Griffin, um, after she was given her honorary doctorate from the New York School of Interior Design um, two, a year ago, was interviewed by El Decor on the topic of diversity. And the, the quote that I found so powerful was she said, there are enough people of color hiring interior designers now because they are making money in ways that they're, that past generations did. There's been a generation wealth gap for years, for centuries, basically. And that those firms that want those clients, and she used this phrase, better have associates that are people of color mm -hmm. if they want that business. And I thought, you know what? You go, Elaine, just say it point blank. That if you want the clients, have the people that serve them that look like them. There yeah. are so many design students. You looked at the demographics I presented of the reality of who graduates from design school in New Jersey. But also like you have to look at the demographic of student that makes it to- design. Oh yes, that's what I'm saying. We have, to, we have to look at that demographic and see what the gap is. Like it has to start pre-college whether, you know, organization like this one, try to have a scholarship more accessible or even money for students who apply like I remember my senior year like I could only apply to one school I mean the application was $50 so I only applied to FIT because that's all I could afford to apply to mm -hmm. I didn't even think about and also FIT was the cheapest so that was like my my options but you know students don't have money to buy the supplies and tools they need to have great portfolios I'm talking about you know students with our background so if we can help them have great portfolios and have that education or understanding of what our industry is before coming into college, then we will see more of them coming into our industry and hopefully graduating and being successful interior designers. And that takes mentorship, you know, we've got to have mentors out there to help, you know, students understand how to navigate the, the field. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a sobering fact, too, from personal experience is that I have a lot of minority students who, when they graduate, they don't put their real names on their resumes. Right. Because if, if they, they feel like if, if an employer sees mm -hmm. Lakeisha on their resume, it it goes in. The, it goes into the trash pile wow. right mm -hmm. away. So you have people with, you know, obviously Hispanic and obviously African-American names putting alternate names on there just to just to get their foot in the door and that's that's to me that's one of the saddest things about about our industry I, I think I think we have to educate them of the value of having a diverse um, uh, employees you know at the company at the not employees I'm sorry members at their organizations or for the professional that, to have uh, employees at their profession they have to see the value, as I mentioned in the in my presentation, of like how having you know like a diverse team you know will be more productive and will perform better, and how it could be inspiring. How could we learn from each other and have look at things from a different perspective and innovate? So I think we have to have a message going out there and advocate for it. Okay, um, so what are some of the ways you think our industry could further support and empower the African American community, um, the Latino community, the Muslim community, um, the LGBTQIA community? How come the, the schools you said? Um, the industry. Oh, the industry, the industry. Well, I, mean, I personally, I think that's where um, groups like the ASID and the IITA have to take the lead in saying that, you know, we, we have to address this as a, and it has to be like a, you know, a top priority Amen. for the industry. Now, Terry, I know you hear, this is not criticism at all, but like at the D, at the DEA awards, you know, we filled the whole room of people and it was um, pretty much all white and all the colored people, we were all sitting at one table. It was me, Nada, Tammy, 
um, one of my students, Natalie, and you know, yeah, you know, it, it's. Wow, it, you're right, MJ. I didn't even. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. It was not. It's not. It was a great event, but you know, it was. It was definitely skewed towards um, a side that. That's why we're having this discussion here today. Right, because it's 2021, and our industry still does not reflect the communities we serve. Right. Um, that's how I feel. Oh, um, I, I think the students are um, afraid of getting to this profession because like they see it challenging. Like, I mean, I, I remember my husband when I went, when I first thought about getting into interior design, the first thing he, he said, like, I'm a... Uh, I'm not sure if you can get a job. <laughs> so how about you rethink your, you know, like the, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, okay, I'm not going to think about what you're talking about. I'm just going to keep moving forward with what I like and what I want. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I feel like um, determination, you know, for the student, it has to be there. I'm not sure how we can implant this, you know, like, and encourage them to, uh, to be in the profession, maybe, um, again, like, uh, promoting and having, you know, uh, this message out there, like, to, for, um, uh, for the companies to, uh, for professional to have, like, diverse uh, employee, that would be great, um, and to have, like, designers from different backgrounds, so maybe that will encourage the student, you know, like to um, to go into this uh, specialty. Well, we've okay. got to have commitment from the higher ups and the leadership in, in this industry to be committed to, um, you know, diversifying their their staffs or their organizations, you know, because we can sit here and talk about this all day long of what what needs to happen but if we don't have leadership buying in and acting on it it's not going to go anywhere we're just going to keep having these panels for years and years and years so how do we get that how do we get them to do that that's the the you that's know, the next step. That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I'm sure a lot of you don't know what that is. That's the next <laughs> step after this event. This is what we are getting out of this event. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I think this is this is absolutely the first step that we're taking. So you know, thank you, everyone. I mean, this was amazing. Um, what we we're doing also is through our mentorship program. You know, that's something that we could also amplify as well. I mean, Lizbeth, you said that you were, you had mentored, I mean, I, and Tammy, you had mentored as well, like to just keep that ongoing and to, to bring those students, you know, throughout the, you know, into the industry and to expose them to more, um, just to, to stay with us and, and become a part of, um, of our, you know, our organization and continue with the, with the, um, yeah with their mentorship mm -hmm. be be part of a family a big family to support you which exactly. i see the asid is our family we when we need any question we need any help we seek you know we connect with each other and we ask and we i we usually get the answer you know like and we be guided by each other we are it is a support and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved in ASID again, because, you know, I just saw that there weren't very many people that look like me, you know, uh, when I go to the events and when I go to meetings and, you know, it's it, I, I'm always one of a few that you can count on one hand. And I know that there's a lot of talent out there. And I know that there's a lot of opportunity out there for people of color to, to design and to work. Um, so we've gotta, we've gotta do things to promote um, that we are qualified, we are here, we're, we, we, we are able to work and we wanna work and we can provide the best designs out there because we're all, you know, talented designers. So we've, we just got to, you know, just um, be there to make sure that we expose what we do and, you know, just let everybody know that we, we, we are, we're here. Right. Cause we're not going anywhere. Right. That's, I mean, right. So you're going to have to deal with us. basically, <laughs> Right. It's, that's what it is. You know, you're not going to, you can build the walls. It's fine. You know, it just gives you more sense of 
you know, to retire. But I think what white America has to understand is that we're not going anywhere. You know, that's it. I mean, so, and Adal was talking about family, but in a family, I want to see somebody who looks like me. And I'm sure, you know, an African-American young girl would like to see somebody that looks like her. Um, that's why then, you're here, Elena. Yeah. Well, that's why you're here. I think you've hit on something really important here, me, is that, 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 you know, your willingness and everyone else's willingness to become involved <clears throat> in this profession, to become involved with this organization does give other people oh, there is someone that looks like me. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's like one person tells one friend and then you tell two friends, it's yeah. gonna grow that way too, or, you know, hopefully more, more organically, but we still have to keep the conversation. Right. But yeah, I think, and then what MJ was saying too, um, you know, when people are younger, because I, I don't know if everybody sees themselves when they're five, 10, 15 years old um, and, and what their possibilities are in life. And I think um, showing kids, you know, how fun design or architecture or any of this can be is another way to start um, bridging the gap and getting more people involved. Yeah. And uh one thing that MJ just brought up to me is that, uh, just to remind everyone that membership into ASID, join when you're a freshman because it's $85 and it's good for the life of your, as, when you're, as you're a student. So for six years, if you're in school for six years, it's $85 for the entire six years of schooling or four years, whatever it takes for you to graduate. But that's the way that you're going to, that you can become involved and you can um, just become a, um, sorry, my dinner's coming. You can become a- um, <laughs> gosh, is, there, is there like a waiver like for certain students? Because just from my experience, it, as a student, I would have never been able to afford $84. Like I could never even afford like a hundred dollar book. But you know what, Lizbeth, we had, a scholarship mm -hmm. last year um, for students mm -hmm. and we didn't get enough participation. Mm. Like, I don't remember exactly how many numbers, but we basically had to say, okay, well, this is all we got. Okay, that's good to know because mm -hmm. like- So you know, as young people uh, have to be, they have to, they have to get involved in- Apply. The, and the only way they're gonna know about these kinds of things is they get involved in the organization. You know, you can join ASID as a student, but you're not gonna know about these scholarships if you just, you know, have the, the letters behind your name. You've gotta be involved, you've gotta be active. You know, I think if more students knew about the scholarship by being involved in ASID, they could have applied. Mm -hmm. you know so they've got to be active they can't just join just to, to say oh I, you know as a resume booster they've got to be active you know and 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 you know there's a lot of people in our organization who have resources and who know of things you know um so if they're involved they can learn about scholarships to help pay for the their membership or 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 whatever. But you you can't just um, join an organization and then and fall off. You've got to be involved in order to to grow and to learn and to find out what's out there. Yeah. So that would be, and be patient. My, yeah, that would be my 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 biggest advice is to join but be active. Yep. Okay. Um, we have a question for Lizbeth. Um, do you do pro bono? projects in America and other countries? And how did you get into doing this type of work? I really love and respect the work you do. That's from Caitlin Cruz. Um, I do mainly pro bono in America. I did, however, go to Guatemala once to help build a school. That was just part of like a volunteer organization, which I recommend to everyone. It's called Hug It Forward. And what the what the volunteer organization does is bring volunteers um, at different stages, but with the concept of having the community do most of the work. So before you going, 
um, they build uh, what they call eco bricks. These are communities in Guatemala that doesn't even have like recycling or trash system. So they have like piles of trash. So they use that trash to create, to create bricks and each bottle takes like two hours to fill, fill up with like all the trash. So then we use that as like the core of the building. So I did that for two weeks. Um, so that's my only pro bono outside of the country, but most of the pro bonos that I've done are uh, in the country and I do it with all other volunteers that are from different firms, FIT alumni, alumni as well. And um, we kind of just like love helping people as a group. So we always um, have ongoing projects. So if, if you are interested in uh, joining a project and just for the experience, um, just reach out to me. And I don't know if the um, our contact information is available, but I'm happy to share that with you if you put your comments and, and if you put your email in the comments. I don't know if I answered your question, sorry. It was like a few questions within one. I can't, you're on mute, Elena. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, another question for you. What was the book you mentioned about interior design? This is a lifesaver, legit book. And it's called Time Saver Standards for Interior Design and Space Planning. I still use it today for when I need to come up with the detail that I haven't done. It's just like, it, it has everything you need. The great, the actually, great Bible. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think you could put it in the chat for everyone? Yes, I will. That, bi that book has been the Bible since I was in college in the That's 1990s. The okay, that is the Bible. <laughs> My Twitter is here. Anyone who's been to design school and that, that book is she <laughs> got mine yep, in my yep. office too <laughs> and i just want to add i couldn't afford to buy this book well, like i mentioned uh while i was in college but i did borrow it so i'm sure like if you're a student there should be a copy somewhere in school if you want to borrow mine reach out but i actually found this at a trish shop i don't know why it was there i think it was meant to be while i was still a student it was eight dollars wow <laughs> yeah. <Awesome. laughs> That's a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I still have it. But I'm happy to share with anybody who may be interested in borrowing it. I think we're done um, here. I think we're out of time. This was a phenomenal night. It was. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. I have just a few notes of that I'd like to wrap up with. And um, thank you to everyone in this panel, everyone in, who attended tonight. Um, uh, Jeffrey, as you said in the beginning, having a diverse audience doesn't mean that we have a diverse organization. So we are striving to become that organization that is diverse. Um, Tammy, you said that we need to reflect on the population that we serve. Amen. Um, Nada, replace the fear with understanding. So important. Um, MJ, break out of the mold. I thought that was um, such a great quote. Um, and Lizbeth, I have to say, this was my favorite quote of the night. I define my success by the amount, the amount of difference that I make. And I think that's so true in our organization. Um, the more that we give back, the more that, or the more that we give, the more that we receive back, really. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you for attending. Have a good night. Thank, thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Everyone. Bye, everyone. See you soon.